Okay, we're rolling. Okay. We've been talking about robotics, acting, yeah. Hollywood, cars. Sure. And human interfaces. Yeah, absolutely. So the human interface um, is always a fiction because the human mind is going to process it in an extremely personal way, often projecting um, onto it your own interpretation. We never actually hold the object inside our brain. We hold a, an interpretation of that object. So in that sense, it's always dishonest, and yet it's all and it's always a fiction. But we're com we're, we're more comfortable with the term fiction than we are um, with the term dishonesty. However, in engineering and science, there is always the urge to get rid of anything that smacks of dishonesty, including any fiction. The power of fiction is attempted. You attempt to exercise it. But you can never get rid of it. Because any time that a person perceives an object, they're going to build a model of that object inside their mind that extends beyond what it actually is. It's a fuzzy interpretation. Sometimes it's more what it truly is. So in that sense, as, as symbolic creatures, as creatures that, um, that traffic in the commodity of symbols, I mean, that is like the, the, the power of the human brain. We always build these metaphors that we know are just that, only metaphors, right? Um, a, a, a car is a steed. A car is, um, you know, my identity maybe, if, if I'm like going to pull up in front of a nice restaurant, right? So it symbolizes um, uh, more than just um, a reliable mode of transportation. Um, so, so where does the human aspect of that comes in? I mean, we were talking about, you know, robotics in the sense that we actually, as humans, want to displace this humanity onto an object that isn't real, including yeah. giving it consciousness, which it doesn't have. And, you know, in our belief systems, like you said, it's it's not really honest, but it's what we're comfortable with. We we want we ro robots to, to be real. We have to do that because that's the way humans are designed and the we're way our brain, wired. And, that's and, the way we're wired. Right, absolutely. And there, there's no way to undo that. Um, so instead, we can capitalize on that. Mm. And if you look at, um, uh, I think we were talking about Steve Jobs, he's a master of understanding that you have the technology and then you have the culture and the cultural aspects of how that technology will play in the mind of users. And the two can be crafted so that they are coherent, but they're sort of separate entities. The, the, um, the perception of the object, the way that it's designed, the way that you use it, the way that it is marketed, um, will change the meaning of the technology in the mind of the observer. But it doesn't, you know, necessarily sort of change the the engineering of the microchip itself. It's a, and how it functions and what it does for us. Right. Um, so. In that sense, he's weaving a marvelous fiction, but it's not fiction, it's real. It's real in the mind of the user. It's a psychological utility that gets undervalued. And part of the, another reason that it's undervalued, in addition to kind of being uncomfortable, you know, dis discomforting to some engineers because, because it's ostensibly dishonest, is the mind is not understood. You can't engineer the mind. I mean, you can use neuroscience, right? So, neuroscience-based marketing is hot stuff right now. But, neuroscience doesn't understand how we process actors or what actors do. It doesn't understand what um, a marketing genius like Steve Jobs does or Madonna or Lady Gaga, right? I think that's an excellent example. That is a good example. How is she um, devising this cultural phenomenon? How does she craft these songs with hooks? How do those hooks stick in the mind?
mean, and it's not just a statistical thing, right? I mean, often we do a statistical analysis of music to find out the patterns of hooks, but that doesn't say how it's actually playing out through the mind and connecting with our sense of identity, our sense of self and other, our, our um, friendship that, um, that we form in our mind with the artist. And what do we get out of connecting with Lady Gaga and Madonna? Like, there's a yeah. different identity that we take on and we become by being connected to them. Right. Ab absolutely. It, and and um, that sense of um, association, both like you say, as you're seeing Lady Gaga perform, you say, I am, in my mind, I'm seeing Lady Gaga, I'm mirroring her, my mirror neurons are active, and in a sense, I'm feeling kind of what she's, what she's expressing. I'm like kind of getting inside her mind. But then I'm also thinking of it in a different way. I'm thinking this is somebody that I kind of know. And when you, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's the bane of professional actors, everybody feels like they're friends with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can't go on the street without people feeling like... Or they're you know, friends the with their character, actually, more so often, than with them. Right. But, they, but people will feel like that, the, 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 you know, unconsciously you feel like the, the actor is obliged to be nice to you and spend time with you because you have this friendship, right? I mean, it, it's just an unconscious effect. Or a connection to, I mean, I'll never forget when... Um, when Richard Dreyfus played Mr. Holland's opus, and he was the history teacher, that uh, if you, I, I was, you know, interacting with him when somebody had a background in history, and actually Richard does in real life have a background in history too, but what they were really connecting with was that character he played. Absolutely. And it was very real for them. So, I mean, that kind of brings us into the whole robotics. I, I know you're sort of a leader in the robotics field. I mean, in, in the sense that we want to project. Uh, we, we started the conversation um, with should should robots and devices um, be given this human facade, this human, this humanity that we want to project. I mean, as humans, we automatically project that. That's right. And what are the pros and cons of doing that when we, you know, when at the end of the day, the robot doesn't really have consciousness, right? In the way that a character that a, a movie star is playing. So the benefits of that versus the, you know, we, we were talking about, um, you know, that in, in a way we want a robot as a friend. We, sure. we would like to we consciously des desire that. We, don't want, we want to be assured that the robot is not an antagonist, you know. Yeah. So, fr you know, a friend and, and um, you know, not a danger. And so we, we, you know, we either want robots to be like extremely servile you know, like the, the tin can that cleans up after us, sort of just follows us around, and, you know. Um, you know, or we or we want um, the kind of robots that Asimov wrote about, where the robots um, sort of develop this um, sense of good and support. And, you know, but the, but even in Asimov's study, uh, in stories, the, the, the robots... Um, had to struggle with this um, sense of um, uh, subordinates, and people never uh, people in the stories had a very difficult time, um, like accommodating robots as potential peers. But what we want from characters when we watch a movie is we want to see the hero. We want to see the hero change, transform, discover, um, become. Lovable, learn, uh, become more wise after um, uh, after uh, addressing those those inner flaws that were required to be surpassed, and perhaps do what we say. Quest. I mean, and, that's why. Well, well, in, for robots, we want them to do what, what we say. We, we just want like them we to want be, them, right? Just so like we, we want dogs to do what we say. Right, but in that's true. But in characters in film. We want to see them gain some independence. We don't want them to to um, to be, you know, weak-willed. And um, and I think so. I think for for me, my quest is 
to use robots as a tool to understand human intelligence and the, the human being uh, scientifically and artistically. So, so my robots are extremely human-like. And it helps me to find the weaknesses in today's best AI, which we're, you know, using in the robots that that my extended team is developing. Me and, and my team, we're developing this, the software, bringing together today's best cognitive software and perceptual software. And then when you run it through a human-like robot, the problem is that you it's not good enough. It's not good enough to be a character yet.